So, so we're now at this moment where we're going to to jump into our 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 uh, centerpiece of our program. Uh, and of course, in this moment, you know, there are about 815 different things we could have chosen to focus on, uh, but we chose very deliberately uh, on the panel that you're about to uh, be part of. And and I just want to say that uh, we have uh, one of my colleagues uh, who I'm about to introduce from the center board uh, as our moderator. Uh, and she is going to lead a very lively conversation with three panelists who I'll let her introduce. So my job at this point is simply to introduce our moderator, and I'm very happy to do so. Uh, and that is uh, a faculty member of CLU herself, uh, Veronica Guerrero. She is an Associate Dean of Undergraduate Studies at California Lutheran University. She's also a full-time tenured professor of management and marketing within the School of Management at Cal Lutheran University. And she's been with the university for about 15 years. Uh, she has been with the center board for a little over two, almost three years. Um, and I think that the, the most interesting thing I have learned about uh, Veronica in the last uh, 48 hours is that her doctoral thesis, uh, and she has her um, EDD from Pepperdine University, uh, also a partner here with us today, but she did that dissertation uh, on a nonprofit organization and some of their work uh, with entrepreneurship and empowering women to, to start their own businesses, and that is Women's Economic Ventures, or WEAVE, as many of us know. Um, so uh, no stranger to either the university or the nonprofit sector or this community, uh, we are in the very, very capable hands of Dr. Veronica Guerrero. So please welcome Veronica. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Dina. Um, it has been an honor to serve as an advisory board member for the last several years and really an honor to be asked to moderate this session today. I have the pleasure of working with three very distinguished um, individuals who have done a lot of work in the DEI area and in the non influencing and impacting the nonprofit work in the community and beyond. And you should um, have access to their their bios. We have a, only a short 30 minutes, so I don't want to um, read word for word what their bios are, but I do want to introduce them briefly. Um, Jorge Ariano is the executive director and head of global health economics at Amgen's cardiovascular bone and metabolic, metabolic franchise. And he's been there since 2017. And what I learned about him in the last 48 hours is he's celebrating his 10th year here in Southern California. So we are happy to have him here in our community. Uh, Eduardo Setlin is the Executive Director of Philanthropy and Responsibility at Amgen. He's also the President of the Amgen um, Safety Net Foundation. And Patrick Salazar is the Founder and Board Director of Latinos LEAD, LEAD standing for Latinos for Leadership, Excellence and Diversity, a nonprofit that seeks to increase Latinx representation on boards of directors in the nonprofit industry. So welcome to our three distinguished panelists today. Thank you for being here. I wanted to start off this session by just having you each share a few words about your thoughts on this important topic of diversity in the boardroom. And if it's okay, Jorge, I'd like to start with you. Of course, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I'm Thanks for the invitation to be here today and, and be part of this wonderful event. Um, my personal disclaimer is that I'm, I'm relatively new compared to many of you to the engaging and fascinating world of nonprofit um, as of the last two years and thanks to Dean and Kate and others. Um, and as a member of the board of the Center for Nonprofit uh, Leadership and, and another nonprofit, uh, I think the topic is extremely important and, and even though it's not new, and many in the audience have been working on it for years and advocating for it for years. I think it's an important uh, for us to keep it alive and to remind ourselves that we need to always move it forward and not get complacent about it. And I'd just like to take a minute to, to quote a couple of uh, uh, figures from the uh, uh, Center for Nonprofit Leadership uh, survey from 2018. And to me, it's kind of shocking uh, that we still have a situation where 47% of the board members for nonprofits in the uh, Ventura area were Caucasians, representing a population uh, of, uh, sorry, 83% of board members were Caucasian, representing 47% in the overall population. Whereas for 
Latina and Hispanic, it was 13% in the board members and 42% uh, of the overall population. So that's something that I think needs to be a, a guide for us to see, hey, are we representing the communities that we ought to be representing? Um, and beyond that, that survey had another snippet of information that I found really interesting, which is what these nonprofits saw as the um, factors defining diversity, because we always uh, go first and quite rightly focus on race, ethnicity, gender, age, those are very important, but I find it really interesting that they identify others like industry affi or affiliation, skills or expertise. And I think those are really important too. To me, diversity of thinking is what really matters at the end of the day, right? Do we have the right people at the table coming with different ideas, being controversial like uh, uh, him, uh, leader mentioned from Carl Lutheran today, that's what really matters, you know, being able to have that conversation, provoking different thinking and creating new things and new ideas based on that debate. Um, so I think it's important that we keep this conversation about diversity alive and we broaden the scope in terms of what is diversity. So I'm very excited to be talking about this topic from my humble, limited experience, but I'm all ears to learn from all of you as well. Thank you so much, Jorge, and thank you for sharing those important statistics with us this afternoon. Uh, Patrick Salazar, would you like to continue our conversation? You're still on mute, Patrick. I, I thought that Dina would just do that automatically. She's been so proficient at so many other tasks. I figured <laughs> I'll just let Dina take care of my mic. Um, Good afternoon and welcome, and thank you, uh, Dr. Vallada, for the uh, for the challenge and the invitation uh, to violate the echo chamber and uh, setting the stage for discomfort. And I, I, I suspect this is why Dina asked me to join this panel, so that I could um, create a little discomfort in our otherwise comfortable uh, home settings today. I'm Patrick Salazar. My family goes back to the uh, late 1500s in what we today call New Mexico and to the mid 1700s in what we today call Colorado. Um, our family likes to say we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us several times. And, and, and we're thrilled uh, to still be on the same ranch uh, that we have a deed to from the government of New Spain in 1750 in San Luis Valley. Uh, it's a beautiful, proud heritage. And this is, I think, uh, what makes the Latino community in particular uh, so wonderful to, to examine is the many, many, many uh, journeys and paths that we have to today's, uh, to today's story in California. Um, words matter. Uh, and, and Dr. Guerrero opens our uh, talk uh, with um, uh, quoting from our mission statement that says, uh, uh, she used the phrase Latinx. Now my 16 year old daughter likes that phrase. I'm, I struggle with it still. Uh, if nothing else, because I can't pronounce it quite as well as uh, as Dr. Guerrero did. My uh, grandfather called himself Spanish. My father called himself Mexican. I called myself Chicano. And I don't want to tell you what the school kids called me. And my lovely 16-year-old calls herself Latinx. Uh, when we say the word diversity, and we use, um, we stream into that phrase with diversity of thought and, and, and diversity of perspective and diversity of background and age and, uh, and, and socioeconomic and, and uh, diversity of, of, uh, of gender identity. All those are wonderful concepts. Here at Latinos Lead, we, we help nonprofit organizations focus on inclusion and diversity of California's largest single population segment, fastest growing, and economically uh, burgeoning uh, Latino community. So that's my expertise. I can't speak as well to the other areas of what we like to uh, call diversity these days. Um, there's been DEI, DEIA, somebody mentioned DEIJ. So words matter, acronyms matter. I'm not maybe as clear as, uh, as most folks are on what some of those are. I'm thrilled to be here. and. Um, and, and look to take up the challenge to, uh, to um, look at the status quo perhaps a little differently. Thanks so much, Dean, for having us. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, 
New Mexico is one of my favorite places to visit, and I've done the pilgrimage from Santa Fe to Chimayo wow. several times. So yes, some delicious food there too. Um, Eduardo, do you want to continue our conversation? Sure. Thank you so much for the invitation and the opportunity to participate. Uh, I'm Eduardo Settlin. I've been uh, at Amgen for 17 years, 20 years in the United States, was not too far from President Valora. I was in Erie, Pennsylvania for three years in a locomotive factory, a pretty uh, 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 impactful scene. Um, I, I ground my perspective in today's conversation around structural inequities in our country. 8% of uh, whites live in poverty. The figures for Latinos and Blacks are respectively 19 and 21%. The wealth gap, average net worth for a white family is 10 times that of an African-American family, eight times that of a Latino family. The significant historical disparity in the representation of minorities in positions of power as well. Latinx are 18% of the population, but we are 7% of doctors, 6% of scientists and engineers, 3% of law firm partners, 2% of Fortune 500 executives. But tell you the statistics for African America, it's even more depressing. Now to put it in the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda, too often Latinx and Blacks are not in the room where it happens. Uh, in my job as the head of philanthropy for Amgen and president of the Amgen Foundation, my team, uh, a small team works with many of you in the nonprofit uh, sector here in the greater uh, uh, LA and Ventura County, as well as around the globe to do what business guru Peter Drucker says. He says, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So our focus is to prepare you to navigate the complexities of the modern world and shape a more inclusive future for all of us. We do this both because it's a social justice issue and because we desperately need the brilliant minds of our youth to address this enormity of the challenges all around us. Truly, truly appreciate the work of the center with long-term supporters in facilitating today's conversation. Just very happy to be here and to learn from my colleagues. Thank you, Eduardo. I'm about to say my, my father actually is an engineer. So to his chagrin, I did not become an engineer. <laughs> That's not in my, my wheelhouse of talents. So um, thank you for sharing those important numbers. We are going to start with some questions of, that we have already. I also invite attendees to please share any additional questions you may have in the chat, and we will certainly try to get to those questions if time allows. Our first question that we have this morning, and I'm going to pose this to you, Patrick, um, involves some best practices, things that strategies that you have seen worked or have not worked in bringing diversity to the board rooms or into the nonprofit leadership. Can you share a few of your a few examples that you might have or one specific? Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, things that we did early on, Veronica, was we looked at uh, engaging private foundations and funding sources that shared our sense of purpose and actually converted their program officers into evangelists for this work. And so to this day, some folks from the Ford Foundation uh, Hewlett Foundation and others have really been very important in referring other uh, funding prospects to us, other people that are in this field, and, and that's really been a rewarding uh, strategy. I, I think uh, strategy also involves a lot of external things, you know, beyond your control. Uh, last year, the California legislature passed and the governor signed uh, AB 979, requiring public traded companies in California to have underrepresented folks, uh, underrepresented folks on their uh, on their boards. Uh, this follows some legislation a few years back that required women uh, to be on the boards of publicly traded corporations. And so um, that external stimulus is moving people in the nonprofit sector to take a little more notice. Uh, I, you know, we all know that there's a sharp-eyed intern or staff person right now in Sacramento drafting similar legislation for the nonprofit sector. So we look to that external stimulus to get folks to, to pay a little more attention to this issue. Uh, in terms of st strategies that probably uh, didn't uh, work out so well, maybe there was like COVID uh, that, that we uh, 
we didn't see coming. And uh, it really had an, an impact on our programming in terms of our training and some of our recruiting. Uh, so much of it now uh, we've had to convert to, uh, to virtual platforms. And thank goodness again for, uh, you know, to our friends at Ford Foundation and others that have funded those, uh, funded those uh, activities. You know, I, th there's been some, uh, some uh, statistics raised and I think this whole strategic piece to me really is one of uh, data gathering. And if you go to our, our website, uh, latinosleadnow.org, you'll see a lot of different studies and information on uh, this issue, on the issue of Latino representation on boards. Um, let's start close to home. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, Dr. Barlotta mentioned their work. And if you go to the Cal Lutheran website, you'll see on their 2022 strategic plan, there are, you know, we talk about being an HSI and then we talk about inclusion. And there seems to be, uh, there seems to be tied to the Latino question or the Hispanic question, one of uh, internationalism and, and immigration. And that's all well and good. But it reflects just a couple of the facets of the Latino experience. Uh, I think someone, uh, it could have been uh, Jorge that mentioned the proportion of Latinos in Ventura County. Uh, last I checked, it was, it was right at um, uh, 30, is it uh, 30 some percent did you mention? So what we have at Cal Lutheran is, is, a, is a board of regents with 28 board members. I'm sorry, 43% is the latest Ventura County number. So here Cal, Cal Lutheran, uh, which is an HSI, which means you have to have minimum 25% Latino enrollment. And their actual Latino enrollment is, uh, is at 27%. So 28 regions, two of whom are Latino. So that's a 7% level of representation. These are all works in progress, I get it. And Jeff Green's fine institution over at Santa Barbara, which is a 35% enrollment Latino, uh, has uh, two Latinos that, that on their board of 13. Now that's their website. This could be different information that they would that they would know. So I think we all need to look at our own institutions, at the institutions that we're invested in, at the stakeholders that are in our region funding our work. And we say, well, well wait a minute, Patrick, uh, uh, Santa Barbara's a public uh, college, but Cal Lutheran's private. Because of their HSI status, Cal Lutheran, according to their own website, uh, was able to bring in more than $6 million in, in Title III funds from the federal government, not to mention financial aid, not to mention uh, uh, you know, loans and, and, and the tax-free bonds for construction and things like that, that are funded essentially by the taxpayers of California, 40% of whom are Latino. So I think it's important to tie these words and these goals back to stakeholders. Who's paying the freight? Most importantly, I think, and I'll close on this note, in the case of colleges and universities, there is growing competition for the Latino student who is, you know, really making inroads at a lot of different institutions, especially state ivies. It's really going to be important to have good folks like Jorge, Eduardo, Veronica, and other Latinos that have put in the work and put in the study to have a voice, as, 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 uh, as Lynn Miranda likes to say, uh, you know, in the room, or our competition for Latino students will get tighter and tighter and tighter. So to stay relevant in California and to keep those Latino enrollment numbers going, we need to look at our own governing teams. And I'll close on that. Thank you, Patrick, for that insightful um, discussion. I will say I, I've served on a lot of the work for the HSI work at Cal Lutheran, and it is an um, enrollment initiative that gets you in, a number that gets you in, and our strive is to become truly a Hispanic serving institution. So there is a distinction for sure. Um, I also had the pleasure of serving on the board, and I have been um, really thrilled about the changes that they have made in terms of um, opening it up to more individuals that are representative of the population of the school. So I really appreciate 
his mm -hmm. comments. Those are important to know. Um, Jorge, the next question is going to be directed at you. Um, you recently served, uh, participated in the bootleg boot camp that was offered at Amgen <laughs> bootleg. But that was that was a a real fail there. <laughs> the boot camp that was offered at Cal uh, at Amgen. Can you share a little bit about that experience and um and and that influence that it might have had in the work that you do? Sure. So uh, first of all, I just want to say that the job that Dina and the and the center did uh, with the boot camp was was phenomenal uh, with a group of executives at Amgen. So they introduced us to what it really means to be part of a, of the board of a nonprofit organization. Um, it was extremely enlightening to to see that perspective. Normally, I had always been at the other side of uh, of uh, nonprofits as you know, donor or contributor, volunteer. Um, but, you know, I think it guided all of us in what we are now trying to do as, as board members in different nonprofits in the Ventura area. Um, and for me, that experience um, sort of made me realize the importance of, of the composition of that board member, who is, who is a member of that board and how that might impact on their activities, uh, the they, they outlook, the way they, they think about the issues there, Kind of devoting a lot of their time and effort to to solve or contribute to solving. Um, so if you think about sort of the big areas like financial stewardship or program design or educational activities, outreach, fundraising, whatever it might be, I think having members who have different perspectives and different opinions and and obviously an ability to work together is extremely important. And, and that I think that was the big learning from that. Uh, effort that um, took us through a journey of I think five or six uh, sessions uh, of the period of a couple of months or so um, and kind of made me realize that as I said before to me at least the boardroom should be a mirror of the community that you're trying to serve and the more closely that you mirror what is happening outside in terms of color ethnicity but also the way of thinking and background and expertise that the very you serve the community. But also an additional component is there is a certain degree of um, professionalism and the skill that is needed to be a member of, of a board. And that's very important because, you know, good intention and dedication is, is a big part of it. And having a big heart, like most, like all of you do to, to devote such an important part of your lives to, to a cause. But, also, there's, you know, components that require a lot of uh, technical knowledge and expertise, uh, whether it's, you know, finance or, or marketing sometimes, you know, and so many others. And I think, you know, my, my day job at Amgen, I work with 30 countries around the world in 12 time zones. And, and that kind of brings my, my reality has a different scope than, than others, right? So uh, how that comes to help the board. Well, I remember the, the first and only face-to-face -face, uh, board meeting that I attended um, right before COVID. Uh, at the end of it, uh, uh, you know, Dina approached me and said, what do you think this, this virus thing, the, the COVID thing, how, how do you think it's gonna impact us? And, you know, I was working with Europe and African countries and Asian countries on a daily basis. And I said, I think we better get ready to be working virtually very soon. And, and it's not gonna be a quick, Thing. So, you know, I think that may have contributed in a small way for Dina to start thinking with the uh, with part of the team about it. How are we going to do this? If, if that is the case, how are we going to continue our educational efforts? And uh, Patrick alluded to that. You know, it's not a, a you know the flip of a of a switch. It takes time and thinking. And I think that's how the difference of experience and expertise and uh, from a professional perspective actually comes into play in the boardroom as well. Um, so it's not just diversity uh, in the in the areas that we normally think as, as uh, being diversity. Um, and I think that's uh, sort of how I see, for example, the transition to virtual as well. That's so dependent on age, but also sort of trade, right? What, what we do, and we have a lot of uh, members who actually have been extremely helpful uh, with the board in terms of helping us move to the virtual 
reality and, and operate almost seamlessly in, in the process of moving from face to face real life to what is now a real life, right? Sitting in our living room for 10 hours a day in front of a computer. Uh, and to do that with a bunch of people with different experiences and different backgrounds, but all equally driven by being compassionate and being understanding and flexible, I think that uh, makes you know, any change much more um, doable and easier. So I think all of those things are coming together in our, in our boardroom uh, on, a, on a monthly or sometimes weekly basis. And I think that's, that I think what we all kind of the little uh, or big contribution that we bring to the table and that kind of some of that is my learning from the, from the bootcamp. I hope that that program gets expanded, uh, not only at Amgen, but also in other uh, local organizations, because I think that's gonna enrich the boardroom of so many organizations and bring that, as I said, professionalism and, uh, and specific skills uh, that are needed to run a good, a good board and to serve the community better. Thank you, Jorge. I would also like to echo your comments on the seamless transition that the center made to really shifting to a virtual environment and offering the program, the same programs um, in that way. So thank you for, for sharing those thoughts. Eduardo, um, at Amgen and the Amgen Foundation has focused considerable company resources towards priorities, both in terms of grant making and within the company. Can you share an example of work with the local organization where you collaborated and maybe shaped um, some alignment with the foundation's mission around the DEI efforts? Sure. I, before I do that, I just have to say how proud I am to see Jorge with us here today. The conversation around, you know, we have four to 5,000 staff at, uh, at Amgen. And people hear about the nonprofit sectors and they're learning, but they're very busy and there's always so much going on. So the partnership with the Center for Nonprofit Leadership was really to say, listen, if you, you have the skills, you have the expertise on how to prepare our board members. I think I have a lot of colleagues who are brilliant and would love to engage. Maybe if we meet somewhere in the middle, we can facilitate conversations that otherwise would not be happening. And to hear what Jorge said, that's the result of that conversation. Uh, some of my colleagues jumped into a nonprofit board immediately. Others told me, listen, I need time to do the research and you're only doing it now. But I'm also very, very proud and very thankful to what you're both doing. And I think I want also to tie back to what Patrick said. I think it's, this is not a set of circumstances where it's just about the board meeting, the, the boardroom, about the pipeline. It's, we don't have, it's, they talk about the tyranny of or. It's end. We need all of those things to be happening concurrently. Today, when I am successfully in attracting more Latinos, let's call it Latino scientists, I'm often doing it at the expense of other biotech firms because there are so few qualified for these positions. We need to broaden the pipeline very significantly so that there are many more folks applying for these jobs. Um, I wanted to, just to note back to your question though, we've been doing a lot of work around supporting underserved populations for many years. Uh, with programs like Amgen Biotech Experience, Amgen Scholars, where we democratize access to the world's best laboratories. Uh, with Khan Academy more recently, uh, we financed their biology content. They went from having roughly 300,000 students doing on their biology platform to 3 million right before COVID. And they are spending so much money on server time because all the kids around the, the, the country and around the nation are using Khan Academy. Um, after the brutal murder of George Floyd, though, you know, our CEO, uh, was very clear this is not a time for silence and challenged us to think about ways to engage the community. The board of the foundation got together and we made a $7.5 million commitment in grants. Two and a quarter was allocated to uh, four organizations doing work at the national level to address systemic racism. Two and a half million was allocated to strengthening our STEM portfolio. And two and three quarters million was allocated to Amgen communities across the country. Um, I want to touch on, on the word process here because, again, we have relations, we have worked in the community for many years, but this was a moment where we took a step back and said, before we go out and deploy the local allocations, let's take the time to learn. Let's take the time to engage with our colleagues on the ground. So we created a new advisory board within each of the 10 sites where we included colleagues from what's called the Amgen Black Employee Network. They did the research, 
they did the analysis. They came to us with their suggestions of what they thought made sense. My team did the due diligence. And that started uh, essentially a series of relationships that are happening across the 10 sites that I think have truly the power to change uh, the way we are engaging these communities. Um, I want to touch on one example briefly, uh, and at the peril of embarrassing somebody on, on, on the call, but it's really a, a fantastic story. You know, the, the LA and Ventura County allocation was $700,000. $80,000 was a two-year grant to Cal Lutheran's a new program. It's called Community Scholars for Black Lives, which seeks to increase awareness of disparities conf confronted by uh, Black Americans. But not only that, also compelling uh, audiences to act. The announcement for this program went out a, about a few months later. Three uh, uh, students were awarded uh, uh, support, and I think we'll be hearing a lot about their work. But the process here is where I wanted just to take a step back and as we think about different ways of doing things and the challenge that President Pallada really posed to us uncomfortable ways. Regina Bettings Muro leads uh, uh, advancement for uh, Carl Lutheran, and she created before the grant, you know, sometimes people say, well, the, the, the grant is the news. No, no, no. The amount of work that was done before that grant, she created real space for dialogue. She invited black leaders in our communities to the table for several two-way conversations. She didn't just enlist their engagement. She invited them for a conversation. She invited them for their perspectives. She offered support. She said, I want to learn from you, and I need your assistance if we are to make it a reality. But she also understood the reality and the resource constraints they were working from, and she put hard dollars on the table to help them advance their missions. She actively listened to them and had the humility to accept that our challenges are truly collective ones. No one can change the world alone. So uh, back to my Hamilton analogy, she created a room where it happens. That room did not exist before Regina got there. She made sure the guest list was inclusive and she challenged the Amgen Foundation and I hope she's challenging other donors around the stable and around the county to join this effort. So kudos to Regina because she invented a, a path forward that we don't know what the results are going to be, but I am darn proud to be part of this dinner table where she has set up. And I wanna see the work of these three students and there'll be some amazing things to follow. Thank you so much, Eduardo. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Regina um, biddings Muro on our campus for sure. She has made such a tremendous impact in her short tenure with us. And I appreciate you sharing that story with us today. We just have, I think, just a few minutes for a couple of questions. Uh, one that did come through, and I'm going to just give you each an opportunity to quickly um, answer the question, if it's possible to do it quickly, is how and where can um, how and where can we find board members with more diverse backgrounds? What are some of the opportunities or ways that we can best to do that? And Patrick, I will start with you, and then. Jorge and then Eduardo. Sure, quick answer, uh, latinosleadnow.org. Uh, long answer, come on folks, uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, the, there, there's a, uh, the HSI group, there, there's a Latino faculty association, uh, there, there are um, Latino MBA organizations, look to your local Rotary, look to, you know, there are so many professional member associations look at the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, the largest single funder of uh, financial aid for Latinos in the United States. They have an alumni association. Uh, you know, for that matter, look at your vendors. If, you, if, if, you're at, if you're at Santa Barbara City or, or Community College, if you're at Luke Cal Lutheran, who's providing your supplies, your services, your, you know, look around. Who's the, who's the subcontractor of your electrical on the new building? Nine, you know, chances are that you'll have uh, you'll have Latinos right there, business owners, uh, networked people. A quick note on 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 that whole uh, question of diversity. I would urge anyone that is working with a nonprofit organization to bring Latinos or or other diverse folks onto their board to not hold siloed conversations. You need to have the CEO and the board chair or, or nomination chair in the room at the same time because 
we all know that's a sensitive relationship. There are a lot of dynamics, right? And the CEO doesn't want to be the one necessarily to go to her board and say, you know what, you kind of look all white to me. We need some more, you know, that's not a comfortable position for her to be in. And it's also, I think sometimes we have, there's great, they're, they're really solid intentions, very positive desire to look at more diverse board candidates. But the conversation can get stilted when it comes into, well, well who has someone in there? Well, I don't really know anyone. And, and so it's very important if you're working with a team that wants to look at a new a profile of board candidate to have the CEO, executive director in the room with the board chair or the nomination chair or else, you know, and we've run into this. I, this is a practical step that we've had to take. Uh, sometimes the message just won't get through um, if you're only working with the CEO. Thank you very much, Jorge. Yeah, first of all, I, I want to write a wrong because I talked about the boot camp and the great work and I didn't mention Karen Bossom, who was an integral part of that. So my apologies, Karen, and thank you again for great work. Um, and then I'm going to try and tie the answer to your question, Veronica, with another comment that I, I saw in the chat coming from Miguel. Um, Miguel was, if understood correctly, we're saying, well, it's great, and we've mentioned, I think I did mention, okay, trying to recruit members with a certain skill set or uh, position or experience, set. and that's fine, but he was saying, well, um, what about the shared and, and lived experiences? Uh, for example, he was saying, well, finding new members for the boardroom, not through the old members, but through the communities that they serve. And I think when we talk about diversity, I think the answer is yes to both. I think, where do you find the new members of the board? Well, go to the communities that you serve and also find a good mix of people with a certain expertise and experience that might not be in the community that you're serving, but might add value to that community and also get representation from the community. So you get that perfect marriage of those who can help with specific skills and, and contacts and experience that might actually help with the uh, many of the activities, but you know, funding might be one of them. Uh, but also those who actually are at, at the other end of the funding, right? How the money is spent, how you know, how those experiences are lived through the lens of those receiving the service or being part of that community that the board is actually trying to represent and serve. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that's actually a great point, Miguel, to say that is the diversity, the real diversity that I was referring to is getting that balance right. So to your question, Veronica, where do we find them? Well, look first at the community that you're serving, but don't stop counting on the existing board members to find new board members, right? There's always new avenues to find people who might be able to contribute. And if they can contribute as board members, I'm sure that you will find a good way to put them to work, right? So I think there's, there's it's a win-win strategy. And, and that's what I really understand as diversity. Thank you so much, Jorge. Eduardo, did you have anything to add to this question? Two, two quick things. One, everything Patrick said and everything Jorge said, I fully agree with them. I would, though, challenge you also to think about, it's not just about finding that board member, it's to enabling that board member to bring his or her full self to the boardroom. Um, there's some amazing free resources out there. I love the Racial Equity Institute's groundwater metaphor. It's a 10, 12 page free document. We need to start having uncomfortable conversations and you don't need to wait for the first Latino, the first black, the first woman, the first whatever to get into your, your boardroom to have those conversations. They're difficult. The, the book, White Fragility, again, it's hard. There are times you read it and say like, okay, I need to go for a little walk. That's okay. That's okay. Go for the little walk, but come back and continue the conversation. You realize that the people around you are facing the same kind of challenges and together there's nothing we can't do. Thank you, Eduardo. I'm actually going to start with you on the next question. I appreciate the insight from our three panelists on that 
on that question and a reference to the literature is always appreciated from an academic. I have also um, read that book. We had a question in terms of a recent Harvard study shows that in order for a board to change and increase diversity, it must already have a culture of valuing diverse perspectives. Do you have any suggestions how we can prepare boards in this way and how do we shift board cultures to really value these diverse perspectives? Yeah, I, I think it, it's this moment of, there's no switch to flip. It's you know, how do you teach empathy? Uh, it starts with self-awareness. I, For me, my grandmother played a role and there was a lot of things she chided me for when I was a kid and told me I had to do and I had to learn that had stuck with me all along. Uh, but again, I've been in the United States for 20 years only. I've taken, so in other words, I haven't gone through the the elementary and high school here to learn about American history. So I've created, I'm pretty studious, I'm studying American history. I'm reading about Lincoln. I'm learning about the Civil War. Again, these are some hefty tomes, but you learn the level of nuance for reality that is uh, uh, not what fits into a tweet. Um, I, I tell you, I've been amazed by, as I talk to a lot of my white colleagues, I'm surprised how few have read classics of literature that, have to, that happen to be written by African-American writers or examine the practices that have gotten us where we are today. Um, I'll tell you, um, Amgen, I want to say in the August time frame, my colleague in communications uh, published an internal only piece where they told the story, they had 20 African-American colleagues from across the country tell their stories. These were people that I see day to day, if we were talking just to some of the examples, Jorge was saying, there's, a, there's an issue with a product, whatever it is. They told me their stories and I learned things about them that I had no idea. And I'll give you some of the, the sense of my privilege as a white guy. I am ethnically Latino. My family went to Brazil from Poland running away at the time of the war um, on my dad's side. But there are some things that for my life here in Ventura County, I don't need to worry about whether I can go for a jog or a run in my neighborhood. I don't worry about when my wife goes out, when my kids go for a run. I don't need to worry about when I go to 7-Eleven and buy something that the cashier is gonna take my $5, $20 bill and say, is this real or a fake dollar bill? Every time I go to the same store, looks at the color of my skin, he doesn't do that. He does that to my black colleague. I don't need to worry about when I move to my house, will my neighbors be accepting of me? So. There, that, that piece of walking a mile in somebody else's shoes, and I really do not believe that we should, it's not the job of black people to teach white people uh, what it is to live on their, on, on their skins, but we need to do the homework. We need to, there's amazing movies on Netflix, there's amazing books. If you're, if, there's so many sources of learning. We owe it to ourselves. And what's most amazing for me at the end of the day is to see 20 years in this country, I've learned so much. This country has overcome so many challenges to get where it is and to be having a conversation like this and to be on the table with the three of you and to hear President Parlotta. It's like, again, I'm going to say it again. There's nothing we can't do. Thank you so much, Eduardo. I also highly recommend Ibram Kendry's book. He has two great um, books. One I have... Um, done in my audible waltz and other the other one I have read, but that they're a great perspective. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jorge, would you like to um, share some perspectives in terms of um, how can we prepare boards? You know, did the diversity within the boards need to happen first? It's difficult to add to, to what Eduardo had so eloquently said. I, I'll just refer back as what I said at the beginning, I think talking about diversity, don't take it in for granted and exposing um, board members and the community at large, all of us, you know, continuously there's to, to what diversity really means. Um, at Amgen, for example, they, they made it a top priority for the entire company. We have it in our personal goals, each and every one of us. And when you're a, a people's leader, like in my case, you have even to that, that's going to be measured at the end of the year as part of your performance. What have you done this year to move the, the needle in, in your, within your scope of your team in terms of diversity and inclusion and belonging? So I think no, no effort is small 
to move the needle, just visibility, talking about it. You know, don't let it, don't take it for granted. Don't let it become invisible, right? Just thinking, oh yeah, we've achieved now uh, whatever we have to achieve. It's all good. Uh, there's no racism in America. There's no racism in our community. Of course, that's not true. Just, you know, getting it out in the air, getting it uh, visible again and keeping the conversation. And to be honest, for many of the nonprofits, I think you have the perfect avenue to to do that with your board members, just get them exposed to the communities that you're serving, because in many cases that that is what the real diversity looks like, and let them walk in someone's shoes for uh, for a little while. That that will open their eyes. Um, I think another thing that we've done at Amgen that is great is this training on unconscious bias. Uh, it's just fascinating, even from a human psychology perspective, how you use your two things, and they ran this test like. Um, you know, uh, uh, when talking about certain professions, how many people think of a female colleague, for example, when they talk about an engineer, when they talk about a plane pilot, uh, and they have these riddles about it. Um, you know, if uh, this mom is with this kid and there's a, a like a pilot, and he's like, oh, wow, yeah, is the father's not there. It's like, well, no, the mother was the pilot, right? Things like that, little things that you know, you embed it in your narrative uh, on a daily on a daily basis, whether it's through training or things that you can do with your with your teams. I think all of those little things kind of uh, have a huge impact. You know, plus obviously the best impact long term is education. Uh, uh, you know, with kids, that's that's the longer lasting and that's the future. So any impact on that, but at the level of you know board members and and the community, I think. Every little thing helps and talking about it is the first step. Thank you so much, Eduardo. I think bias training um, in any hiring process is, is really critical and infusing, as you noted, you know, how the contributions in the DEI area as part of performance management is also so important to really changing the culture and behaviors of organizations. Yeah, um, blinding, okay. blinding the resumes is an idea that I'm a big fan of, right? When you receive a bunch of resumes for hiring as to for the names and anything that can tell you about gender or ethnicity to be taken away and just, you know, uh, that's, that's a simple exercise that can, can help um, kind of get those biases away a little bit. I mean, not completely, but I think those, those help too. Thank you, that's a great point to make. Thank you so much. Patrick, do you have anything that you would like to, to add on this topic with us? Yeah, I think two things, uh, one to do and one not to do. Uh, the one to do is reach a mission. If you're a nonprofit organization, reach a mission. Read that fancy diversity statement that you had somebody put on your website last week. Read it and live it. And part of that is human development. When you include a Latino, an African-American, a South Asian, an indigenous individual on your board of directors, you are opening them to new networks. You are providing governance training. You are helping them understand the issues that have an impact on their community. You are helping them be a more responsible leader of the community that they identify with. That pays back in their other work. It will make them a more likely candidate for promotion at their, at their office. It will prepare them to perhaps start their own nonprofit someday in an area that of interest to them. Read your mission statement and live it. That's what to do. What not to do. Um, I, I love these bumper stickers. And look, I, I, I get it. End racism. I have time for that. And maybe I'm getting old. Uh, and, 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 and so I don't have time to end racism. And I'm not interested in taking on the challenges to fix your biases. What I am interested in doing is helping you become aware of your biases so that they can influence how you make decisions and who you recruit to be on your board. I, it is not my job to make you less racist and less biased. That's on you. Do it for your kids. Don't do it for me. Do it for your kids. At Latinos Lead, we hold folks accountable. Be grown-ups. Get in the same room, reach a mission statement, 
everybody work together, get the budget done, hire an executive director, get to work. Grownups, especially in California, that work together toward a common mission with people that are not like them are much less likely to carry forward negative stereotypes. They begin to learn that Dina and Veronica and, and, and Richard and Jeff and me and Jorge and Eduardo are actually have a lot more in common than we do in, in you know, that's different from us or, that, or, or, you know, our beliefs are not that different. Our commitment, our engagement, our love of Southern California, our caring about children's or maternal health or, or, or pollution or education, we share so much more. I don't have time for bias and racism. We have a job to do. Let's get in the same darn room and do it. We're Californians, man. We know this. We know this. I, I, I'll close with this. I was on the phone with with a uh, with a, a, a and I'm not naming names with the CEO of a sizable nonprofit last week, and and and, and she was telling me how, how how committed their board is, and and they just got done with a consultant that helped them draft this beautiful statement, and and, and geez, look at our staff and and how diverse our staff is. I said, you're in LA. You don't get points for having a diverse staff. You, you, you would have to try to not have a diverse staff if you're running a sizable organization in LA. Look 20 years out, are you ready? And if you don't have women and Latinos and South Asians and other folks on your board, you're not ready. We're here to get you ready, we're, we're here to help. Uh, and, and a shout out to my good friends over at the African American Board Leadership Institute ably the good folks up at leap um, it's leadership education for asian pacifics uh give them a ring they, and, and they can help you with uh community, communities that they serve thank you so much patrick i have one um final question as we are wrapping up here you know there is one thing to recruit the talent to recruit the representation on boards and then there's another to retain right so how do we create the inclusive cultures that encourage retention and where they actually feel valued and empowered to be part of the decisions being made Patrick, I'll start with you and then I'll head to Jorge and close with Eduardo. Step one, don't ask them to lead your diversity uh, initiative. Uh, again, it's not their job, right? Um, step two, put them on a committee. Make them, co you know, ask them to co-chair the, the gala. Ask them to come to a foundation program officer site visit. Have them sit on a major donor appeal. Uh, you know, it, I think, with all board members, it's very important that they feel that they're being of value, that they're being of service. Um, one of the things we do at Latino Sleep, we will not recruit, uh, uh, you know, just for one board member. If you have no Latinos on your board, we won't accept an agreement to recruit for you unless you're you're recruiting at least two. Because the research has shown when you're the only African American in the room, you're the only Latina in the room, it, you know, whether it's true or not, you feel sort of, you know, tokenized. Um, I think in terms of retention, um, be aware of how things are coming across. And I'll close with this. In the environmental sector, in the arts and culture, where we do a lot of work with those two uh, fields, you have what are known as legacy boards. I kid you not, they've been on the board 15, 20 years. They're founding board members, right? And you've got eight or 10 of them. And then you ask Veronica and Jorge to come on the board. Well, guess what? Those eight or 10 people that have been on there for 20 years, they can finish each other's sentences, right? They're, they have such an embedded dynamic and culture and flow to their work at the first board meeting, Veronica's going, uh, hang on, uh, page three of the budget has this line item and they're all looking at each other like, oh my God, we're gonna be here all night because Veronica wants to look at the budget. Say, darn right, I wanna look at the budget. I'm a new board member and I'm legally and fiduciary responsible for this. Oh my gosh, you know, I think it's important to make sure there's an onboarding process and a mentor process for new board members to make sure that they tell Veronica, 
I agree with you. That line item squarely. Call the financial, uh, call the finance committee chair before the meeting. She might be able to help clear it up for you. And so learning those processes on a board, especially if it's your first time on a board, it's very important. The responsibility is on the new board member too. Right? Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was great. Um, hard hit. Thank you. Um, I'll just apply what I think is, is true for all recruitment and retention. I've worked uh, for 20 years across many different cultures. I think if you create a vision that people believe in and you take actions towards achieving that vision and people feel heard and feel that they, they're contributing, I think you don't have to worry about regardless of you know, race, backgrounds, social economic status. I think those three things hold true for, for most situations across most cultures and it's kind of human nature. So I don't think there's any magical bullet. I think the more you try, even you might make it worse. And Patrick said, you know, if it's the only person in the room that looks a certain way, that might not be a great thing. Or if you hired in and the first thing you ask him is like, yeah, you're gonna lead that diversity thing that none of us believe in, but you're gonna go on because you look different. So you're diverse enough to run it. You know, that's not gonna work. So make them feel part of the board. Uh, they have to feel part of the board. And then if the vision is there and the actions are there, it's not just a, a line item on, oh, actions for next year, becoming more diverse. And oh yeah, you approve of it. So we're done. You can sit in a corner and we'll call you next year. We still want to be diverse. Um, if you take it seriously and have the vision and the actions and they feel heard, I think that that's all you need. Thank you, Jorge. Eduardo, I think we have like 20 seconds. Do you have any closing comments? I Whatever. Dito and Dito, just so appreciate such an important conversation. Thank you. I really want to extend my deep appreciation for the very honest conversation that um, we all shared today and your perspectives and really providing practical advice and great examples. So thank you. It was an honor to, to, to have this conversation with you this afternoon. And with that, I will hand it back over to Jeff. Thank you all so much. And, and I will in turn, uh, thank you all for a really grounded, honest, frank, direct conversation. It's what we all need. And of course, not just today, but going forward. So thank, thanks to all four of you. Uh, and it is my turn to now hand it off once again to uh, Dina and Jenny Lynn, and they're going to tell us a bit about where we go from here. Absolutely. Well, uh Real and candid conversation. I saw that pop up a few times in the chat box in the last 45 minutes. And I think also a clarion call for us to work together, work with one another um, to make progress and advance forward. Um, the, the one thing about uh, this year is calibrating our programming and making sure that we don't exceed the bandwidth, um, yours and ours. So just know that you'll be seeing um, this work show up in our program portfolio. And um, we also keep enough space for uh, requests and recommendations. Um, I can imagine that there's gonna be a, quite a fair amount of work and enthusiasm and requests coming from today's conversation. So I'd, like to really express a deep appreciation to everyone today, um, whether you had a speaking role or if you were participating in this important discussion um, that we, we have a lot of work to do, but it's possible together. Jenny Lynn, anything you want to add? Oh. She can unmute herself. There we go. Yeah, I read her lips. <laughs> What a way to end. Oh my God. Uh, as if it would, it just wouldn't be a Zoom without that sort of thing. Right. But I just, I would love to reiterate just my gratitude um, and really just here's to the new year and hopefully being able to meet all of you in person very, very soon. <laughs> Fantastic. In the next couple of days, you're going to be receiving an email with some links of some of the resources that folks were sharing in the chat box. We're going to also be asking some feedback from you all, um, requests for continued capacity building and conversations for 2021. Be watching for that email. And um, I really do hope that we've spent these last couple hours together wisely um, with the, the DNA really being about celebrating our 
extraordinary nonprofit sector. So thanks everyone. Jeff, um, magical um, job being our MC. Everyone who made today possible, all of our incredibly generous sponsors. Um, just really, really delighted that this is where I get to live and work and with all of you. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone.